Hello and welcome to this episode of Pause with Nandini on NRI Affairs. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first Australians. We recognize their cultures, histories and diversity and their deep connection to the lands, waters and seas of, of Queensland where I am based and the Torres Strait. We acknowledge the Yadera people and the Turba people as the traditional custodians of Mianjin, Brisbane, the lands on which we live and work and learn. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and pay respects to the Adivasi, the first people and the indigenous communities who are the traditional custodians of the lands, waters and forests of our country of origin, which is India. Thank you so much. Um, today we have a very interesting and possibly complex conversation, but I look forward to those. Uh, this is National Reconciliation Week, and what that means is that from May 27th to June 3rd, it commemorates the May 27th referendum in 1967, which saw more than 90% of voters support the inclusion of all Indigenous Australians in the census. So there's a whole uh, slew of activities that happens around this time. But this made me think of identity and it made me think of minority communities and the fact that there isn't always enough recognition of differences within the Australian Indian diaspora and also the way that the Indian Australian Indian diaspora is seen vis-a-vis -vis other minority groups within Australia. And there's a lot of nuance there that seems to be lost in the discourse. And we, I want to examine who that uh, mudding of waters benefits and who it doesn't and what can be done possibly to, um, to improve that. Joining me today is Mudit Vyas. Thank you so much for joining us. He is a recent research graduate from the Monash School of Media, Film and Journalism. He studies cultural and creative industries. He has also finished a mammoth task of finishing his thesis, and it was on diversity washing of privilege in cultural economics. Now we'll have to have him explain what all of that means, but first, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, um, as I said, the context of what this conversation is about, I think maybe we can just begin with some opening thoughts on, um, on what you have tried to address in your thesis and what you see as very high level, what you consider diversity washing. Uh, diversity washing largely is when and this is in a transnational context where people actually move from one nation state to another so where they might hold a lot of privilege in their place of origin but when they uh, reach their new uh, adopted home uh, they in a racial context they try and position themselves as a diverse as a person of diverse identity or diverse origin, which might not necessarily be beneficial to the whole framework of diversity itself. Because, yeah, I'm largely questioning the idea of representation itself because someone from a very uh, privileged caste background in India who actually even has the privilege to be able to relocate once they get here in Australia, for example, uh, they occupy diversity spaces which they might not necessarily be suitable for in terms of like, are they actually benefiting the idea of diversity itself? So when they position themselves as diverse or like as, uh, or if they manufacture a marginalization uh, in, like what's the right word for it in uh discourse if they manufacture a marginalization for themselves a marginalization that might not necessarily be real then are they benefiting the idea of diversity itself here so yeah when that is what i feel 
uh, have defined as diversity washing when you position yourself as diverse when you're not necessarily so diverse considering where you're from do you consider that um we, we all hold especially the world the way it is today multiple identities that for instance someone could be privileged in one um experience and in one location and not necessarily holds the same privileges when they're transplanted to a different location does that have any bearing on this argument at all yeah it's interesting it's the the whole so i studied from a lived experience point of view and the lived experience is you're choosing to become an australian so then uh we have to also define what racism is which is actually enshrined in law versus what xenophobia is which is just lack of common ground culturally and so me just to give an example uh there is this whole idea that people need to go out there and like people in privilege australians especially like white australians need to go out there and create frameworks where better integration is possible for uh, expats or whatever immigrants skilled immigrants as we largely come as here but then uh, what is the responsibility of the person who is actually choosing to relocate here and what are they bringing with them the value systems so is it possible for someone to harbor conservative regressive values back home and then come here and ask for progressive reform for their benefit so it's not really a question of like what how the situation is different it's a, more of a question of hypocrisy that's such an interesting idea because it's so true right and what it comes down to is possibly what is most self serving um but that self serving does it really serve the ideals of diversity as you mentioned which you know there's so much talk about diversity here but um one of the things that you do talk about is cultural economics right yeah and, um could you talk a little bit about what that means when you're talking specifically in the context of the indian diaspora how does cultural economics have a play in who gets a voice here and who doesn't oh yeah so regular economics is basically uh with something that is largely governed by rules of supply and demand so that also governs skilled migration there is lack of a certain skill so certain people choose to immigrate here because they have a skill that is in shortage here cultural economics on the other hand is a little more tricky because it's not defined by the laws of supply and demand like we don't know what movie is going to be a hit what song is going to be popular what video is going to go viral anything that constitutes art and culture or anything that is creative we don't know what is going to find resonance uh, what's going to resonate with in a particular culture so which is why we can always say anything can be art but then in that framework representation becomes tricky because then anyone can say oh i am different in this way so what is a meaningful way in this cultural economic framework for a person to find representation to be able to meaningfully and meaningful is important here to meaningfully create art or be creative in that sense so that difference is important like one has a supply and demand governing mechanism whereas other the other one doesn't and so in that framework how do we define what is diversity and what's not I think about this sometimes in terms of uh, empowered representation which is like you can have representation but if that person on that stage so called stage has no real power to either benefit themselves or further their own uh, communities 
agenda or to even have and if for it even to be normalized for them to be at that space and not be um, always in terms of affirmative action, to move beyond that. So this empowerment of representation, I think it plays quite closely into this uh, cultural economics that you're talking about. You mm -hmm. do say in your uh, thesis, I, I found this quite interesting. This is from Paul and Gay, diversity is an operational outcome of a process of positive discrimination. Positive discrimination. That's actually the definition. It's the U United Nations mm -hmm. definition. And I think it's quite, uh, like I said, that, you know, this thesis of yours has got a lot of uh, academia in it, which for a, a regular reader is sometimes difficult to pass through. But nonetheless, that these are things that seem to be quite pertinent now as we're having conversations around, um, around diversity and representation. You do make a distinction between essentialist identity and non-essentialist identity. Oh, and, yeah. uh, when you're talking about um, Aboriginal um, identity, I think the way you frame it is that that is essentialist because tied to land and tied to... Also identity. born out of a process of subjectification. So right. they were marginalized by another culture. Correct. So when you... So how does that then... What's the difference between essentialist and non-essentialist identities okay let's let's look at it from like a simple perspective which is defining essentialism first uh, essentialism is when a quality uh, from a cultural uh, privilege point of view uh, or disprivilege point of view Essentialism is something that is valid as is a valid factor to be considered in a diversity framework if it actually defines a particular community or group based like it outlines their process of subjectification over a period of time. Like it addresses it directly. Like for example, I've given multiple examples. Yes. Uh, but I think the simplest example is subjectification based on uh, stolen land. So dispossession of a community because they were either relocated from where they were they actually were. Like a lot of Native American communities in the US and Canada, they were moved to a lot of reservations. Yes. So that's a process of subjectification as opposed to moving as an expat or as a skilled migrant you're not being you're not being forced to do it it's a choice and so one is essentialist and other is non-essentialist in a diversity framework and therefore your argument is that if you're trying to uh, bring in true diversity then you need to consider whether a non-essentialist community is trying to take the space or represent or misrepresent themselves. Yeah, as diverse. In diverse, right. Okay. And then, so then with that argument, who is it incumbent on to recognize this and change this? Is this a government problem? Is this a community problem? Oh, it's, it... it's a responsibility of uh, all stakeholders to educate themselves in this regard. Mm. But yeah, I think the largest, the biggest stakeholders are, especially in terms of numbers, are artists themselves or creative people or people who actually perform labor in the cultural economy. So that understanding needs to be there because usually we live in a trend culture where everyone tries to force fit themselves into new whatever identity groups that are created every day. That's how the Western culture works, especially in the academia. So yeah, there needs to be some skepticism as to like, can we apply everything on everyone? 
that that skepticism is important on all stakeholders parts but especially like cultural laborers themselves there has been so much talk lately um well lately it's relative but around this idea that you know the gatekeeping in cultural spaces especially mm-hmm. in india where typically and now i'm seeing a lot of it like the bengali intellectuals and because i'm bengali i get to hear some of that uh, it's a class thing yeah have been gatekeeping and while you know they they're studying things that uh ostensibly are about social justice or um, you know uh, underrepresented communities but they themselves are not able to critically examine their own privilege and therefore make space um in that aware state and not always try to hog the the stage and the opportunity and all of that and one of the things that you did in your uh, quoted in your uh, thesis was the problem with identity politics is not that it fails to transcend difference or as critics charge but rather the opposite that it co- conflates differences so yeah. this high privileged person coming out of india along with a caste oppressed person are being seen through the same lens and yeah. again of course it is suiting the um, you know the caste privileged person far more and they are not stepping up to say look i think i'm the wrong person to mm. be represented in this space because i have more in common with the privileged white person in your country than the other person from my own country who we may share the same skin color may may not but our worlds are completely apart and i lived experiences are completely apart yeah that's what you defined is called the phenomenology of difference it's, there you go i knew you would have a big word for that <laughs> it's the, like the objective lived experience is different right so the thing is though when a system enables and uh, sort of helps people who are already privileged they're going to fight tooth and nail to dismantle it and you know it's going it's going to be very difficult to dismantle a system which is based on making the privileged even more privileged right um and in this case what you said about all the stakeholders have to be aware and you know and so then we come to this thing of okay they have to be aware and there has to be that dreaded word discourse right so there has to be discourse now there is discourse we are talking about it everybody is talking about it but how do you actually give up power if you're in a position of power if you have this recognition that i have undeserved power in this framework then is it in the art space for instance it is keeping yourself out of things which are giving grants to diversity mm-hmm. or keeping yourself or like bringing together other people from your community who don't share the same privilege and fronting them in cultural spaces fronting their art fronting their music song dance whatever it is and not co-opting is that do you think in a practical way uh something that as an indian australian community we need to start thinking about yeah so i've actually thought about this so when we produce art and we try and force fit into a framework which is a diversity framework for funding or whatever reason uh we still see ourselves as indian australian which is my problem like why can't hindi be an australian language why can't punjabi be an australian language so i don't have a problem with privilege i think privilege is important because as more people have privilege it will level the playing field but yeah it makes sense in a different discussion altogether <laughs> uh but that's the thing when people try and position like their whatever performance or like a concert they're organizing and then they try and get funding for it under a diversity framework it becomes an indian australian thing why can't a punjabi music concert be an australian artist concert why does it have to be indian australian 
as we discussed it's essentialist or non essentialist eventually yeah. it becomes that no it's this this also is a little bit when i think about it it's a little bit in line with what we were saying or what i was kind of saying that there is a progression from indo australian to centering it as australian i think it is a journey mm -hmm. and i think maybe we are at the cusp of that because there is a certain confidence of identity that perhaps takes time to build in 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 the context of colonized the colonized world now kind of coming into spaces where they were you know maybe an aberration or really standing out just by the fact that they were indian today there's a far maybe greater confidence in i'm a scholar i'm an artist i'm a musician and that's my primary identity and maybe that's a journey and i have to speak to you about spivak because there suddenly spivak is the flavor of the season uh, based on what you're talking about is actually a social construction of identity of when do we actually start believing in ourselves as australians and not indian australians does it take generational uh, does it take like a few generations or and in what context does that difference apply specifically so yeah and that's why uh, not all pioneer spirit which is what i consider this as like when we try and say that okay our culture is australian culture it's not necessarily indian australian culture uh, that there is a pioneer spirit in it but it does not necessarily fit the diversity frameworks we currently have i find it quite close to a cosmopolitanism framework where it is not that you have to be the same mm -hmm. to be included in the framework you can be different but your difference is not the factor that you know is your defining identity you're cosmopolitan you come from different places you have some links to culture from other places mm -hmm. which are generational you pick and choose today as younger people you pick and choose the music you want to listen to the films you want to watch mm -hmm. you straddle different cultures and different identities for some reason there could be children sitting in india and they are who are so into japanese fiction for instance right mm -hmm. so much more than their own local um, you know vernacular literature for instance and it, it i see it in a bigger framework of the world becoming a little bit more um you know cosmopolitan in that sense that maybe the younger generation see less barriers than we did and we see less than the previous generation did yeah and largely this is privilege coming to a different cultural uh, locus and then enhancing their privilege even further right let's talk then as we're talking about privilege let's talk about caste yeah. i know monash university was is the first is it in australia to specifically have caste in their is uh -huh. it in the same work for, yeah i did there is some information on that that um, melbourne university they they probably they had done something as well so i do see caste coming up more and more now in conversation whether we speaking with government or with other um mm. other organizations and institutes i see there is some of you know the beginning of wanting to understand it because i think there's a recognition that till you understand caste it's very difficult to understand indian society because mm. it's so deeply entrenched um and to your point of this diversity washing what is the role of caste that you see in that space uh, i'll have to address it from a different point of view uh, the role of caste as i see it now has become in in western academia especially it has largely uh, been molded around how anti racism has been going on how how an activism around anti racism has been going on when there is a key difference between those two ideas 
race is actually materially real. People are different based on their race. As opposed to caste, which was socially constructed by one group to subjugate another group. So I, the, the objective of anti-racism has always been liberation and equality, whereas our, our objective with caste has always been about annihilation of caste. We need to get to a place where we forget about this horrible thing. But what I'm seeing is largely a lot of privileged people now coming here are adopting anti-racism frameworks and terminologies and just applying them in a blanket way to caste activism. And I think it's not really doing anything in terms of change. It's mostly just helping them build, I guess, their careers and their research ideas. So yeah, we... we that we need to look at caste from that point of view that the objective ultimately is annihilation of caste. We need to forget these this horrible entity that has governed our society, not under any laws, but just through cultural and social means. You do talk about it a little bit and you, um, you explain what caste is and also Baba Sahib's you know, his work in in talking about caste. Um, and it was interesting that the 1931 caste census brought to light that the ruling caste, so-called ruling caste, made up less than 15% of the total population of India, right? Um, and according to Ambedkar, there exists two Indias in the subcontinent. Mm. The idea of two Indias, which is one is caste privileged and the other is not, if you take that idea and take it into the Australian concept and you say that more often than not caste privileged people come to places like Australia have the opportunity to come because they uh, have it's a logical conclusion we don't right. have data to support it though. which we've been kind of pushing for saying that we need to do a little bit of more in-depth research we've been talking to institutes saying we really need to map yeah. but anyway, that's a different conversation so then I'm saying that when it's so skewed if we take that as a premise that caste privileged people have come here, right? And that and that is the majority. And then they sort of, again, if we talk about cultural spaces, so what they are fronting is they are fronting and they are, um, they are propagating mm -hmm. that narrative, the majoritarian narrative. And therefore, to your point, is that really playing the role of the diversity that... It's Australia not. Wants to... No, it's not. They they are playing the opportun opportunity game where the current trends are anti-racism and decolonization. They're using these terms and they're applying it without any caveats to anti-caste politics and building their careers. And it is not necessarily helping anybody except them. Except themselves. Talk to me a little bit about performative empathy, which you have uh, spoken about and I found it quite, it can be confronting for people to hear that, but I think it's an important sort of looking at the mirror moment. Uh, what do you mean by performative empathy and how in some ways is it weaponized and, uh, and almost commercialized in the, in the pursuit of uh, cultural power? I think it's a part of the consumer culture we live in, largely. Like, like how I talked about trends in academia, eventually those spill over into the larger market. Uh, and so, everything becomes commodified over time. Someone who's doing activism to build a following followership on Instagram, someone from a caste privileged background. They are, uh, what what is the material benefit of their work? Is There is no analysis of that. The only material benefit is to them in terms of like building a following behind them, being able to come across as someone who can speak on this in an authoritative manner. 
And so what they do is they commodify already existing trends and they take them and they apply it to new things. Mm. Right, right. And it becomes performative because A, it's benefiting only them, which is the obvious, but B, because it's it's not new. Like they're not addressing the issue at hand from an objective point of view. They're just trying to push this idea, a new idea, a new need of the R through an old lens. And so that's another, like, those are the two aspects of performative. And so, like, screen you... people on Instagram trying to tell them, look, anti-racism and anti-casteism are the same thing. And when they are neither benefiting anti-racism, activism, or anti-casteism, I actually make them sound similar or, like, equivalent. This is what we were talking about earlier, which is the conflating of differences and trying to kind of look at everything through a single lens. Yeah. Um, finally, I do want to talk about this idea of reconciliation when it comes to caste. Not that I'm in any position to talk about that, mm -hmm. but it is an idea that I think, um, you know, we haven't explored in terms of the Indian context because there's still so much of um, pushback in... Um, privileged spaces to talk about caste as a problem. A lot of the privileged spaces, academia set aside, they will engage with the issue, but in regular civil society, if you talk about caste today, it's centered around reservation. It's centered around um, the fact that it's something from the past. And, you know, and, and you, Let's look it is something forward. from the past. That's actually it's it's an ancient social structure that has persisted. So that that has persisted is something that they they don't agree with, right? So then, when I think about reconciliation, it is built upon acknowledgement. It is built upon fact and truth telling, and the ability to look at your own history without uh, being defensive about it. Where do you see um, us on that journey as Indians? Yeah, it's interesting. And again, it needs to be addressed from, from two different perspectives. What is the responsibility of someone, uh, say someone from a European background who are born here in Australia? Uh, what is their responsibility in terms of reconciliation? And what is the responsibility of someone who's actually coming here? They're first generation expats. And those are two different things. So a person who's born here is not making a choice to be born on stolen land. So their responsibility is to educate themselves. And I think the culture largely yes. is doing a good job of doing that. But the privilege of the Western world is built on, especially New Zealand, Australia, Canada, uh, the US, the four big uh, new world colonies. Uh, the privilege of the societies and the economies there is built on dispossession. So when we are actually choosing to come here to further, further enhance our privilege, I think the responsibility is greater to not just educate ourselves, but see ourselves as partaking in something that that someone who's born here without a choice can't necessarily undo in the ways we can undo it or like not undo maybe, but like course correct in some ways. So yeah, I think a uh, an, an expat who's coming here has pro probably has a higher responsibility. And they're not necessarily going to be white, but they're going to be privileged because Australia hardly has any um, other form of migration except only the privileged ones can skilled, come. Skilled migration is primarily. Now, that's a very interesting point and I haven't heard anyone actually make that point. So thank you for kind of touching upon that, I think it's something to think about. Again, I mean, in the course of one conversation, we're not going to solve problems or even 
you know, examine things in, in as much depth as they need. But it's it's a thought starter. It's something to definitely think about. I was also wanting to ask actually in specifically in terms of the caste journey mm -hmm. uh, and reconciliation in that space within the Indian community. Right now we're seeing there's there is in some spaces there's tremendous anger and there's tremendous uh, fissures because things are now bubbling to the surface. As we saw in this Spivak confrontation that happened, it completely polarized um, civil society to a great extent because um, these are things that perhaps now have become such emotive issues as well that for centuries you've been trying to oppress. Then now when we are talking about it, you're trying to tone correct. Mm -hmm. Then you are telling us that you don't like our way of disagreeing with you, right? So all of these difficult conversations are now bubbling to the surface. And so for me, like we are at a particular point in time, which is perhaps quite a distance away from genuine reconciliation within Indian society on the caste issue. Yeah, um, this question is especially interesting because we actually don't talk about this in our daily lives. Like there's no acknowledgement of, like there is actually acknowledgement, but a very performative acknowledgement of how India is, is united in diversity when somebody wants to gain diversity points on the Western front. But largely people don't talk about what form this diversity takes. So I feel reconciliation in an Indian context is actually more about education than recon reconciliation here is because I think they've already in a lot of ways crossed that barrier here. There's no understanding. People still don't know how, what actually the statistics are behind uh, caste privilege, especially population statistics. People do not understand what is the difference between a tribal background is everything like you said, everything is considered in a reservation framework. So when somebody talks about reservation, STSC becomes this one thing. So there is a difference between scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. And these schedules exist in the constitution for a specific reason. And they have different meaning. And now we have a new schedule of uh, backward classes as well which is governed by the national federal government and state government separately. So, and why certain communities have been, were classified by the British as tribes, because they were not necessarily racially diverse to caste privileged people, but they were culturally diverse and there was a specific reason they were scheduled as a tribe. There were communities that were scheduled as criminal communities for a very long time which were recently which have been decriminalized over time those are also considered scheduled tribes uh scheduled castes largely make up about 16 to 20 percent of the population but they bore the brunt of indian casteism and even though we have had reservation for what 70 years now 74 years we haven't really except for like Cla upward class mobility for certain, uh, I mean, it's random. Like upward class mobility is random. We haven't gotten close to actually forgetting the idea of caste at all because it's entrenched in our cultural ethos as well. Like when we get married, especially if you come from a Hindu community, your caste is important. Now, I guess upper caste marriages are fine with parents, but if you're marrying an, a person from a scheduled community, it's still looked down upon. People will talk and whatever, like when people are getting, a, a union will not be given the same form of legitimacy, social legitimacy. And I, I feel it's a kind of abuse. So, these are like different aspects of reconciliation. Like how, how can two people marry each other and not think about caste? 
कैन दे जस्ट टेल दे पेरेंट्स एंड दे पेरेंट्स नॉट आस्क कि कौन सी जाति का है वो द अदर पर्सन एंड इवन इफ दे कैन हाउ डू दीज पीपल मीट इच अदर हाउ डू टू पीपल फ्रॉम डिफरेंट कास्ट बैकग्राउंड कास्ट प्रिवलेज कास्ट ऑफ प्रेस इवन मीट इच अदर एक्सेप्ट फॉर लाइक दो रैंडम केसेस वेर सोशल अपवर्ड मोबिलिटी हैपन्स एंड देन but it doesn't really happen because largely reservation only exists in government institutes and the very first thing that happens when you enter a government institute is people ask your entrance test scores and if it's slightly lower they identify you as a reservation quota student and like people that come from a certain background from larger cities from certain schools will form their own groups and they will mix in those groups so how do these two people who might want to marry each other even meet and interact how do we create private sector corporate jobs where you know that there is going to be good representation of all scheduled communities because largely the corporate sector has no reservation in india no, not largely it doesn't and so people who go there are mostly people from caste privileged backgrounds so where do you actually meet people who are from a caste oppressed background where do you actually meet people period you meet people at work and in places of education that's pretty much it uh, and so if these places have been segregated by law now what is the way of undoing it these are like questions that we need to ask so <laughs> i'm i've been thinking about these for years so i have not been able to distill these thoughts into like bite sized sentences but yeah i think you you shared um you shared something that i think at least some people are thinking about and hopefully people who are in a position of authority and in a position of power whether these are hr heads in big corporates or or strategy and planning uh not going to happen government it's a very uh, this idea of meritocracy is very problematic in india um we consider reservations unmeritocratic even though everyone's passing the same exams like at the end everyone's clearing the same exam so the exit criteria is same for everyone so i think there's a huge problem in understanding meritocracy in india as well yes i agree actually because people don't understand why reservation exists and exist uh that i think a lot of uh, caste scholars from caste oppressed backgrounds have done amazing work on identifying how after uh, the mandal commission was implemented in 2006 the number of private universities has gone up gone from being 20% of all of the education sector to close to 80% now in just 15 20 years so there has been a huge boom in the private sector because private sector doesn't have to have reservation in education right so even conservatives and both liberal governments they have made significantly reduced investment in public education and so the seats have number of seats have stagnated even though the population has grown so everyone's fighting for the same number of seats in the public sector and it, in that environment it's very easy to distill down the discussion of reconciliation to reservation when dr ambedkar actually specifically talked about this fact that are you even marrying like considering marrying someone without considering their caste and if not are you even ready to remove the implications of caste from your surname and if yes then how are you going to meet such a person the fundamental questions yeah and i think that whole idea of intermarriage is still there it just hangs over us because even if we want to marry someone there are cultural implications to a romantic or even friendships like you're going to be friends with someone who shares your 
uh, cultural background who watches american television and can talk about popular music pop culture in a very specific way and i'm talking about like the really caste privileged uh, upper class metropolitan culture in india and here like how are you even going to there's going to be no cross cultural interaction do you not feel though that with social media being a bit of a leveler where based on your interest or you don't have to be in such watertight class groups and no, you... class groups are it's it's more instinctive than conscious yeah yeah so you don't you naturally gravitate yeah, to you don't know who you're going to make friends with the so familiar what is going to govern the the variables of who you become friends with or who you become romant romantically entangled with and these are like complex psychological questions as well which i wanted to bring psychology as well into my thesis but then it would have been like it would have meant that i had would have had to spread myself too thin and so i avoided that maybe that's another one and we'll have you back to talk about the psychology of all of this but thank you so much i think it's been a really interesting conversation uh while it has you know by the nature of these conversations been touching upon the surface of various issues hopefully people watching listening will find something of value to explore and to go down those rabbit holes uh, you know in their own in their own journeys uh but thank you so much and i really hope our paths cross again and we can bring you back to talk about this with a little more detail thank you definitely i'm up for it absolutely